Um, so thank you so much for joining us today, everyone. This is the Center for Art and Wood. My name is Nava Milliken. I'm the director of the center. And we are joined today by a very special guest on the occasion of the run of the exhibition Wood and Body, uh, Expressions in Contemporary Jewelry. We are so, so grateful to be able to host this conversation today. And before I introduce our guest, um, I want to remind you of two things. Number one, if you'd like a um, uh, the texting of the conversation to um, appear simultaneously as we have the discussion, you can click on um, either the bottom or the top of the, your screen, depending on your device, the CC icon, and then you will have a live transcript. Um, and the second thing that I would like to encourage you to do with me is to join me in acknowledging that the Center for Art and Wood is sited on the unceded territory of the Lene and Ape people who were and continue to be active stewards of these lands. We humbly recognize and express our gratitude to those whose territory on which we live and work, and we at the Center for Art and Wood continue to work to dismantle ongoing legacies of settler colonialism and to recognize the hundreds of indigenous nations who continue to resist live and uphold their sacred presence on their lands. Now to introduce our guest. With us today is David Bilander. David is a Swiss-born artist. He's based now in Munich, Germany. His works investigate questions about identity, affiliation, judgment, and perception, how it is steered and how one can shift it. He has um, served as an apprentice as a goldsmith in Basel and also worked for Georg Sprang in Schwäbisch Gmund in Germany. And he studied from 1995 until 2001 at the Academy of Fine Arts in München with Professor Otto Kunzli, graduating as a Meisterschule in 2002. From 2006 until 2010, David was the creative assistant of Professor Daniel Kruger at the Burg Gibichenstein University of Art and Design in Hall from 2011 until 2013. He was also an external tutor in the jewelry department of the Gerrit Rietfeld Academy in Amsterdam. David has won numerous awards, including the Herbert Hoffmann Prize in 2010 and the Francoise van den Bosch Award in 2012, as well as the Swiss Grand Prix Award in 2017. His work is represented by Ornamentum Gallery in Hudson, New York, and Rob Kudis in Amsterdam, Gallery SO in London, and Solothurn Gallery in um, I believe it's Switzerland, Gallery Funaki in Melbourne, Australia, Antonella Vianova in Florence, Gallery Wittenbrink in München, and the Atta Gallery in Bangkok. David, it's such a pleasure to have you join us today, and I'm going to hand it over to you for an introduction of your work, and then we'll take it from there. Hey, thank you, Nava. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely an uh, absolute pleasure to be here. Um, I'm, I'm based in, in Munich and hello everyone from Munich. Uh, so, um, and I'm uh, unfortunately not in my studio at the moment, so I can't really, this is not my studio, but uh, I have at the moment a band practice. Um, and <laughs> so next, uh, in the next room, uh, Sasebo is playing the music. I don't know if you can hear it at all. Um, <laughs> and uh, so I take a little break and uh, uh, we'll go afterwards and play some more music. Um, so I'm just um, in a room. Uh, I'm very thankful that I can do this now here. <laughs> yes. Um, and we had a conversation when there was the the, the uh, uh, body and wood exhibition um, that I was I was really uh, Stefan I think told me that you know you want to have that piece and I was thinking oh that's very interesting you know a whole institution dedicated to to art in wood and um, also being really aware that I'm not uh, you know I'm not working in wood basically. <laughs> actually, uh, and that is uh, the, the question of materiality. And we, we were then 
in a short conversation we had at the time, we were thinking how interesting it is to, to talk about matter and reality. And uh, we thought just to give a tiny little introduction into the work, I, I will share now the screen uh, and just show a little, some works and particularly the discourse of materiality, uh, which I'm interested in. And let's see if it works out. It should, hopefully. So it should work. Yeah, there it is. Do, can you see it? I, because I can't see anything anymore now. Yes. But you, you, you can see, yeah. <laughs> so materiality, yeah, I, I'm, 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 first of all, a jeweler. Um, and the way I develop my work is that I have an idea and I want it, um, you know, I want to make a thing. Um, in this case, it's a brooch. And they, but I don't want to make a brooch. I actually want to make a, a, a lip. So a mouse sticking the tongue out. And um, because I always develop the work um, um, in, in, in that, um, you know, first is the idea, and then I research for the materials. So it's hardly ever the same material. And I'm incredibly unsentimental in what material I'm actually uh, uh, then um, solving my problem or so solving the work. And the, the questions I'm, I'm mostly interested in are the questions of jewelry. You know, what can, what can jewelry do? Where is it, where can it make a good contribution in a discourse, be it uh, in the society, be it on the body, in the, in, the, in the connection as a compound image? How does it change? How does it shift? Uh, these are uh, my questions. I'm not even interested in jewelry per se as, a, as, a, as, a, as an ornament. Um, I'm, I'm more interested in that I can put certain questions or make certain statements or, or, or um, uh, yeah, place these um, within the parameters of jewelry where they where they are particularly interesting so this is a very very old work it's over 20 years old and so this is the the rubber lip um, and obviously you can see this is a, a, a rubber jar seal and the tongue is there already and it has a, a couple of um, for me relevant um, parameters and and one parameter is that I you know, I don't cut anything off. It's the whole thing. You can put it, you know, rip, rip it apart and you will have the ring with the tongue um, of your muesli jar uh, back. And uh, it, so it, I have the tongue already there. And um, with the, with the, in, the, in the goldsmithing discourse, jewelry discourse is always this, this idea of, you know, having, uh, creating with, particularly with metal, creating, great shapes and, and they have to be smooth and they have to be in a certain proportions. And this does the rubber all by itself. And it has also a, a wonderful thing is that the pin, which necessarily needs attention, is also done by the rubber. And, and in, in the last thing is when this mouse gets old, it will uh, get very dry. You can see it a little bit on the, on the, on the right side that it's quite dry. And this um, is again wonderful because it becomes kind of sunburned lip. And, um, and, and all of these uh, little things, I'm very, very curious about these things. And that's why I choose a material. And um, I wanna go even further with the, with the, with the material, uh, you know, the, the question of materiality. And this is my, my basically the, a work I have, been preoccupied with it, with it for about 20 years as well. Uh, this was the first attempt, uh, the, the smoke ring, actually the smoke ring in ring size, as a ring, as a ring to wear or as a ring to, to own or to possess uh, about, you know, eternity and the, the ephemeral and the, the wedding band, which is, you know, theoretically should, should be very, very sturdy and be forever and and, and, and of course the, the question of value. And so I built a, I built a smoke ring machine. 
This is the last machine I built it's 20, in 2013. Um, and this machine creates a smoke ring in, ring in your ring size and puts it in a pouch. And um, so you go to the museum counter and you get a, a pouch, you can see it in the machine. And you, so you open the door and you hang this pouch into these brackets and then you start the process. I, I can show it to you, it's a little tiny little film clip. And um, so, so the visitor sets off the, 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 the whole process by pulling a, a, a knob here. Yeah, it makes also a sound, maybe you can see. So in, in the back are four uh, time uh, delay relays and they uh, control the whole process. And you can see a trail of smoke going down, which is produced in the cylinder. That's the as a steam actually a, a destillate. Now the smoke goes on, and now you have to watch because the smoke ring gets produced. You close the bag by pulling the knob, and then you can take the finished ring home. There is a second one which we don't need, and this is actually the pouch. Uh, you will go home uh, with in the end and you can decide if you want to open it. You know that there is a ring in there and you don't know if you should open or if you should be very careful or not. Um, materiality, you know, is this jewelry? Is it, is it, um, it doesn't make it to the, to the wearer, but it's of course the process of the making. You can do it yourself. And then I go um, on, I, I go a bit quick because we wanna talk together, not only me, it's the cardboard series. Maybe some of you are familiar with this. This is the very, very first um, uh, card. These are the cardboard mock-ups actually I made to make the cardboard bracelets. And um, that is of course, then the discussion about, you know, your perspective, how you, how you, uh, perceive materials because you if you see it so I made these in these are silver they have white gold um, staples um, and these objects as autonomous objects um, they're just cardboard if you see one you can't tell uh, that it's not cardboard you're not anything yeah okay what is it and uh, there is the applied art, so wonderful, you know, the moment you touch this and you feel it and how, you know, the material, the materials, the silver, the weight of it, um, and then you have it, you get engrossed, you have it in your hands, and then you put it on, and this is then the third, you know, the third step is what happens with this object when you have it on your hand. And you go into public and people look at you and they think, well, what is this person has on, on, on her or his hand? Um, is this, you know, done by your grandchild or for your birthday or so? Or is it a kind of a mad person doing things from, from cardboard? Um, and all these questions, this is uh, very much uh, what interests me. Um, the cardboard has also, you can also shift that cardboard uh, theme in that I make it out of gold. It's a crown. This is the crown which is in the uh, MAD uh, collection. Uh, it's actually at the moment in the uh, 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 45 um, stories uh, in this exhibition. Um, so there is again the value or the, you know, the most valuable or the most uh, cheapest material or also that excess at the moment with the cardboard with with Amazon uh, shipping everything around we have so much car corrugated cardboard now you probably too here and this is the, the um, and another uh, approach with the cardboard this is uh, I made this for a Belgian gallery and it's a, a do-it-yourself um, crucifix where you can uh, actually staple Jesus on the cross um, and uh, hang a little crucifix in your house, which is probably a, it's probably a very Catholic thing here in, in Bavaria particularly. Um, I'm not religious myself, but I like that very much. So this is then 
the uh, the final object and and it's quite amazing how how what an impact it actually has to do it and then to put these staples in the hands and in the legs and i just go on quite fast to the sausages and i was thinking you know wood um when do i use wood and uh this is one of the two woodworks, one you have, ha have had in the exhibition just now. This is another one. It's a, it's a little bit older. Um, and the sausages uh, are actually, the whole set is, is, is three sausage necklaces. And one is the Vienna sausage, the Frankfurter and the Weisswurst, which is a sausage which gets eaten in Bavaria. And all of these three sausages, um, I was, of course, looking for the right material again. I was doing my research. And, and here again, I can quickly describe. Um, first is the idea, sausage. And then I, it, sometimes it takes me two years, three years, before I find the right material. Um, and I try everything out. I read about uh, the sausages. I read about the culture of the sausages. I read about different materials. I try materials out. I'm very, very unhappy. It's an agonizing process for me. It's terrible because I already know what I want to make, but I don't know what the, what the material will be. And at some point, it will strike me really like a, you know, it's, it's, it's like a, like a flash and I know um, I make the sausages out of uh, this chair. Uh, where is it? So you can't see it, but you probably know the tonnet number 14, the coffee house chair and the bent wood here. Um, this was the first mass produced chair and the, the, the original tonnet, so one of the brothers, they were actually in Vienna. So I made the Vienna sausages. And there is in, in Frankfurt, it's the same sausage. Um, it's called Frankfurt. And because the brothers had a fight and the whole tonnet company or part of the co tonnet company went to Frankfurt. So I made the Frankfurt as, as well. And the third one is, of course, where I'm based at the moment in, in Munich. And why I choose this wood is, of course, because the whole chair, I can use the whole chair again. I don't have to refine it in a way. You can basically put it back again almost. And, um, and here you can see it, how it's, it's cut. And you, you would all know more about that than me, actually. Um, but why I specifically am so excited about this, the, the bent wood is because when I design a sausage, I would always design it in that shape, a uh, classic sausage shape. Um, but the wonderful thing is, which in the way th these, these chairs are produced, in the way this bent wood is actually shaped, um, it, it gives the wood a torsion, a torsion in the three-dimensional torsion. And this makes uh, the sausage at Tonpleu, and you 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 think this is a real sausage, and you it's wobbly in your hand, and uh, and when things like this, I can find things like this, and um, it's 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 an absolutely uh, it's it's a wonderful moment, and uh, and I'm very very get very excited about it, and so I I shape these, and then I uh, they're varnished seven times and. So, so you have, when you, when you from far away, and this is again a jewelry story from the distance, they're just kind of crazy comical sausages, uh, you know, like cheap, they could be plastic. And as soon as you get close, or if you have it actually on, you know, the sound, the warmth, you can see the old wood, um, you can see the grain of the wood still, um, and and uh, you you um, you suddenly have the wood and and and, and, and how how it moves around it and it's in a way a very very classic uh, necklace shape um, which 
um, is of course also an important story for me as always, how can I seduce uh, you know, 21st century urban living person to adorn themselves with a piece of, with, 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 a, with a necklace of sausages without, you know, but being beautiful and, and without being a freak. And this beautification um, is maybe also, and, and the question of beauty comes also in the last work, which I uh, will introduce, and this is the, the Pinocchio nose. Um, this is the original Pinocchio I made. Um, and this is also a necklace, and this will also be worn, and, and, and how it hangs, you know, how high it hangs. Uh, it's always be hanging between your chest. Um, and, um, and here the wood is again very, very important because this is wood from a confessional. Uh, you know, from a Catholic confessional, and there is the story of Pinocchio in there, and the, of course, the phallic form, and uh, you can also put your nose in, it's very, very beautifully carved, very fine, you can also breathe, you can actually wear it as a Pinocchio nose, um, like a, a kind of a gag nose, um, but normally you would have it as a, as a pendant uh, between your breasts, and uh, and this is actually part of a whole series of noses I made and which are all playing with also the kind of impossibility of, um, of being worn. You know, the, it's very, it's, for some people, it's very tricky to wear this Pinocchio as a piece of jewelry when they know it's from a confessional. And here I made a clown nose which is actually carved from ivory, from a, from an ivory uh, um, uh, uh, billiard ball. And uh, you can see this if it's carved, you can see, uh, I, I hope you can see that too, probably, that you can see the patterns of the, um, of the ivory um, uh, inside. And it's, of course, it's quite heavy, but it's also, um, it's such a funny, jolly, shape and everyone remark you know everyone recognizes it as a as a clown nose um, and uh, of course it has then the weight of the impossibility that you even you know the the, the you know the the, the drama uh, of the situation that this is actually an elephant task uh, it's, it's basically impossible to wear and um, and this is another piece i made uh, for Australia, the, the koala nose. Um, I made that last year when there were these horrendous fires where you know billions of, of animals died in these uh, in these bushfires. Um, and I made that uh, also that kind of gag koala nose. Uh, it's carved out of jet, which is uh, fossilized coal. And um, I go back to the original, uh, the original. Um, uh, uh, Pinocchio, um, you can see it here in, a, in the studio, uh, in the moment of making it, basically it's almost finished. Um, and I want to show you a very last photo, and this is of a work. We have seen it on the, uh, I think on Instagram or so, we have advertised, or you Nava have advertised, and Katie, uh, the, the, the talk um, with this image. Uh, that was a, a, this collection, Pick Your Nose collection, I made uh, for Ornamentum Gallery for Design, Design Miami, we showed it. Um, and uh, this one is a different one, it's also Pick Your Nose, and I made it in collaboration with uh, Gallery Funaki in Melbourne for the uh, NGV Biennial last year, actually. Um, and um, uh, Simon Lee Ammon was uh, the curator and they wanted to have that work. It's a similar situation, also called Pick Your Nose. And here we have six noses which are carved from a native Australian timber and uh, which is, uh, has very specific and, and, and uh, it's a very precious woods uh, timbers 
uh, particularly for the uh, for the uh, native Australian uh, First Nation people um, um, in Australia. And the seventh one, the, the one on the left, is the Whitey, and that is the confessional one, uh, uh, which is the you know the introduced uh, wood, which is in this case maple. So. That's a very, very short and maybe a bit quick, but it's, I think it's rather interesting to now have a conversation now. I try to get back to us and then we can, yeah, we can maybe start a, a dialogue now. Yes. I hope, but I hope it's, it's, it was not, not too random or chaotic. <laughs> Thank you so much, David, for um, giving us this insight in your work. Now we can play. Um, and I, and I want to invite everyone here to um, include your questions in the chat as we're talking. And um, David and I will speak for about 15 minutes or so, and then we'll open it up for questions from everybody here. I'm sure you'll have a lot of questions. Um, and, um, and I want to make sure we participate in them larger discussion. So David, you gave um, a lot of um, parcels to unpack uh, in your talk. And um, so the first, the first thing that I wanted to ask you about is, is this notion of covet, coveting um, jewelry, which I think goes back as far as the concept of jewelry and adornment has existed. This, this question of value and desirability of the object. And the way that you've kind of broken it down and allowed material to speak for value in a spectrum of works from one side, um, the last uh, work you showed us, Pick Your Nose and Pinocchio, which is, a, which is on the one hand, a very thoughtful, by the other hand, almost irreverent um, translation of that concept, but then on the other side, you have a completely dematerialized work, the um, or almost completely dematerialized work, the uh, smoke ring series. So, could you talk about this um, this concept of desirability in your work? Yeah, I think that uh, for me it's particularly interesting, is because you know most of the works um, they they often scratch you know on on the silly and they scratch on 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 humor and they scratch on uh, on in a way do do i humiliate myself if i adorn myself with with this and my job um of course of what i how i describe my job uh, is here as the as the author of this work is how can I you know, how can I make a Pinocchio gag nose in a way that in the moment you you come to this work and you you touch it and you 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 contemplate about it that you get seduced to to, to have it, to touch it, to play with it, to, to carry it with you around, to make it part of your self-identity. Um, and you don't feel stupid. And this is again and again a twist I try to find, you know, where is, where is the, like in the sausages, where is the beauty? You know, how can I make that possible? That, because it's, it's, a, it's quite a, because my, my, my work and all my, my pieces, they are made as a the jewelry work I make, is made to be worn and made to be worn in public. And it's not performative work, you know, this is not for a specific situation where you have a stage and you 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 can of course wear whatever you you know, whatever you like. No, you have to, I have to make sure that people integrate this in their self-identity, how they, how they want to you know, be seen and, and read and understood. Um, and uh, so the preciousness is always, uh, you know, is, is always in there. And, and how can I make a piece which is so, has so much seduction in it that, that you cannot resist 
uh, to, or at least some people cannot resist to, to, to put it on. And, and then it's part of their, of the, of their self image or the compound work, which it becomes, you know, and it's, it's so different if, if, I mean, imagine you wearing the Pinocchio or me wearing the Pinocchio, you know, these are two completely different works and they have nothing in common with each other. Huh? And they tell a different story and they have a, uh, they, so the narrative is completely, again, you know, and this is of course, one of the wonderful things with jewelry is that you tell the story when you put that piece on and it becomes part of you. It's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it, then it's actually finished, you know, then it's actually a work, uh, which, which is, it's never, you know, that the jewelry is always the secondary. Of course, I make an autonomous object, which is a sculpture on its own when it's on the table or in the showcase, in, in maybe in your exhibition, but, um, but the, the, the actual place it, it is, is when you put it on and it becomes this compound image and, and this, you know, and the, no one says there is a Pinocchio walking with a woman <laughs> when they see you, it will always be this Nava walking with something on, which is the Pinocchio. And this is, these are all these interesting things about, you know, how do, how does it become precious? Mm. And that leads me to one um, conversation point that I really wanted, I was really looking forward to discussing with you today, um, specifically the role that Wood plays in this discussion, because one of the guiding principles that was driving my curiosity as I organized, well, sort of conceived of and organized this exhibition was the way that in almost every society around the world in every culture, there is some kind of mythological story surrounding wood as a stand-in or trees as a stand-in for the human body. So we have this long history and very rich set of traditions that, that jewelry artists in particular who are using the material of wood are working within. So how does that, that figure in your work? Especially when yeah. you are as, as an artist who, who works pan materially. Um, <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> no, I mean, the, you know, I mean, the wood is of course also incredibly, it's just an incredible material to be, to be around and to, to um, you know, to be in that dialogue. I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm unsentimental in choosing a material and I couldn't care less what kind of material it is. But in the moment I decide that it's wood, um, it, it, it of course, it, uh, I, 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 I'm extremely interested in the specificity of the, of, the, of the cultural understanding of it, of the materiality, what can I do? How can I stretch the material? You know, how can I approach it? Um, um, uh, not as a woodworker, you know, I'm not, I'm not a trained wood person. Um, and uh, I also can also, sometimes someone else can do it. I don't, I'm also unsentimental in that way. Um, but with the carving, of course, it's, it's just a, an absolutely wonderful process. And, and then in, in, you know, how the, the original Pinocchio, I think the, the one you have is, is pear or something, it's a pear wood. Um, but this is also part, you know, I, I bought these old co confessionals um, on eBay from Catholic, you know, dismantled Catholic churches. And, um, and suddenly this wood is so much, you know, s something so different and something so horrendously kind of, uh, you know, weight, weight, there's a weight on it. Uh, uh, solely, not the material itself, of course, but, but, but you know, what, what is the, the history behind or the social context or the, 
uh, you know, the understanding. And, and, and also with the wood I used, let's say, particularly the wood I used then in, in, for this work I did, I've done for the NGV triennial, um, you know, the, to, how to source these woods and, and how far can I go actually? And, and uh, I can't pick it up, you know, I, I need to, to be also in a, in a, in a, in a, in a dialogue with the people who own this, you know, or, or you know, belong to these timbers, and they, I, I can't just make my, you know, I just take it, <laughs> yeah. So, um, and and uh, this is also in a way, uh, also for me, a relatively new, uh, you know, it's a new discussion to to understand materials. In a, in, a, in a far different way. You know, when I did my apprenticeship, um, precious metals or so, it was more about the value or what can they do? What can they, you know, what do they mean in terms of, uh, you know, transporting a story or so? But, you know, how, you know, how, you know, that, 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 that discourse has shifted so dramatically. Uh, uh, within, you know, the last five years, maybe, or I can't really say exactly a time. Um, and it's so interesting now, you know, to choose a material is something so different now than it has been. And that's fascinating, the way that the material can serve as a subtext for every conversation that a work is meant to um, expose us to. Yeah, yeah. And also that I... Uh, also myself, you know, if to in the retrospective of old works I've made, you know, is this still possible <laughs> or is it, you know, what does it mean? What is it, does it mean now? You know, I, I also I learn every day uh, that, 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 that the narrative I have grown up is, is, is not right, you know, that's not the, that this is, a, a, we, I learn and learn, <laughs> you know, how, how things shift and they shift so dramatically, um, um, which I find for us, uh, from, from us, from the artist side, it's, it's just the most wonderful thing in a way, you know, it's very, of course, one is very insecure uh, and, and kind of shaken, but it's, it's, it's of course, it's, it's just great. You can you can visit every idea again, and, <laughs> and it's just you know it's it's super exciting. Yes. Also, yes. Also for the Center for Art and Wood, um, <laughs> <laughs> and and I think you've um, really beautifully treated the material of wood, which is precious in some contexts, but absolutely quotidian in others, and. And I think between the, the Pick Your Nose series and the Sausages series, you explore that range. Um, and the, with respect to the sausages in particular, there's, yes, there's this cultural parallel story, um, but the way that uh, both contexts, the tonnet chairs and the, um, the sausage pieces that are meant to be worn themselves, they do relate to the body in different ways. One is adorned by the body, the other supports the body, um, but both rely on the body in order to deliver the kinds of messages that they're trying to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the, you know, and also the chair, you know, it's a, it's it's now of course it's a it's a sort of the chair yes. so to do it's a collectible chair so i have 12 chairs and i cut them up and and but it's also a kind of a stupid chair i, I don't i mean we probably have sat on one it's it's always wobbly you know <laughs> they're, always, they're always not so really uh, you know it's yeah but it was a great idea of course it was it was also i mean the idea of the bent wood um as you probably know much better than i do is is, is of course to save the material you know you had to you, you don't have to cut uh, the chair out of a block basically and uh, but you have a uh, just a long rod and you can make that three-dimensional uh, shape which was an amazing uh, you know an amazing idea to to uh, to also to to uh, how to deal with that resource you know with the resource of the of the of the wood you're using 
mm. and uh, that you can actually also make a chair for you know a democratic chair. It was it was one of the first really democratic chairs. Uh, at least I cannot speak for 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 the United States, of course, but for Europe certainly. It's, uh, that was the thing, you know, suddenly you can make 20,000 chairs <laughs> and everyone can have one and every cafe can have one. And you can sit comfortably and they are also rather beautiful as well. Yes, absolutely. Um, and I, I think you have um, brought a, this discussion of empathy into your work in the contemporary jewelry field um, through your materials, but also through your imagery and ideas. Most of your work is figural, um, um, not, not necessarily dependent on the material that you use, but it tends to be recognizable representations of objects or human humanity or creatures, zoomorphic, zoomorphic forms um, in your work. And, and every whether or not it's, it can be seen as um, cynical, which I think some might approach the Pick Your Nose series as, as a little prickly um, or as a kind of social critique. Uh, there's still a balance of humor and empathy in that work. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the, as a cynical, I would not want it to be seen cynical at all, actually. You know, also the Pinocchio story um, you know, one knows now the Pinocchio story mainly from Walt Disney, but uh, but uh, the original uh, story by by uh, uh, Collodi, which is from eighteen hundred and eighty three, I think, and um, that was a social um, a social manifest because it was all about becoming a human, and it was about the, the workers who didn't have enough education, and he was a scholar, I think, and his, you know, the, 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 his, his uh, story of Pinocchio was that Pinocchio, uh, uh, he needs to learn things to become a human, you know, and to become, uh, to grow, and uh, that was his mission. So, and the, the 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 liar, we, you know, the the the, the liar kind of um, what we all think about now, um, that was in the first version of of the Collodi uh, Pinocchio story was not even there. You know, his his nose didn't even grow in the first version uh, of that. That became later. I mean, it was done by him, but but um, but it's more about. Um, yeah, it's it's become how to become a human um, in in his how he understood. We have reduced it, of course, through particularly through you know through uh, Walt Disney's Pinocchio to it's a it's a different a different story now. But that's also it's there's a lot of empathy in there. You know how how this 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 wooden figure becomes becomes a, a, a person and becomes human. You know becomes alive. And uh, yeah, yeah, there is, there is, there is, of course, is empathy, you know. And the empathy also um, is also um, in when you have. Uh, my, my work gets worn a lot, you know. I have people who buy these works and they put it on, and I don't know anyone who has not a very, very tender um, relationship to this object you know you see people constantly touching it and 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 of course co conversing you know so you have a you are with my works most of the time you know that you will be you will face a conversation at some point uh, it's not uh, it's unavoidable basically but you but you know that and that's why you choose them or you say no today i can't deal with it so you leave them at home um, and 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 this, you know, that they are sparks or initial sparks for conversation. Initial spark, you know, the cardboard. Um, who do I share with? Uh, you know, the, the what it is or or what it means, and what do I think if I see this person? Uh, this is, uh, yeah. There is no. That's not a cynical. Um, uh, uh, there's no cynical idea behind you know even if the things maybe they look, look funny or so or 
uh, sometimes even stupid, but but not in the in the whole image. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Um, so in the last week's discussion, uh, we had the well, last week we had a panel discussion with a number of um, leading thinkers in contemporary jewelry in the U.S. And we ended the discussion with the question, why should we care about contemporary jewelry? Um, and I am curious to know how you would answer this question. <laughs> I don't know if we should care, uh, to be honest. I think it's just, um, I, you know, for me, um, I see jewelry, as I said, I'm not very particularly interested in adornment itself. I'm, I think for me, jewelry is just, um, it's just a discipline or a medium like any other medium, you know, like, like painting, like music, like photography, like sculpture, like dancing. And, uh, and, and this medium, jewelry, has very, very specific parameters where it works and where it doesn't work and where it works best, you know, and, and, and to understand, for me, it's very interesting to try to understand more and more of these parameters that I can place my questions there. And, in the, in the, and the contemporary doesn't interest me at all anyway, because it's just jewelry, you know, it's not, I'm not a contemporary jeweler, every jewelry has been contemporary at some point. And they, and, uh, but, but for me, it's, I understand it just that it's, it's, it's a wonderful, very, very specific uh, medium for placing questions in a way which is, which is unique. You know, and if I place that same question in painting, I have to, you know, where, where I, for example, I have the, 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 the distance for contemplation, the physical distance that I'm actually here and the work is there. And I have this conversation and the jewelry does, you know, has, has all these other parameters, which are so specific. And that's my interest. And therefore, um, one can care. You know, as if 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 I if I have a certain question and I think if I place this in the jewelry theme uh, and I make a jewelry work out of it, that will be exactly the right. You know, let's say that the, the small green machine and the small green. Uh, this is not. I don't place that. You know, this is a jewelry work. And it and and it's it's about jewelry. This is not a machine in a shouldn't be in a fine art context. I say fine art now as a classic distinction. Um, uh, it's not a it's not an installation. It's not it's a jewelry work, and there it does something else. And if that work is 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 in the context of of a of a, a sculpture or of an installation or you know a machine, it's way less interesting um and 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 i i think there is the value and therefore i care huh? thank you um i want to open it up to the the questions from people who are joining us today um please feel free to enter them in this chat function it's there for your use uh but in the meantime david um we talked a little bit before the um, our, our conversation started uh, about the provenance of wood as a material. Um, and I mentioned to you, you know, the fact that wood comes to us with its own history. And you touched on that a little bit with the Pick Your Nose series, um, the, the meaning that is brought by the previous usage of the material and the way it, that shines through in your own work. Um, could you drive us a little a little around a little bit in your intentions um, and when it comes to the use of wood specifically? Yeah, I, I do, I, you know, I do, I do think it's, it's either, um, it's either the, the 
the curiosity or the interest in the process of shaping it because it's so unique in that way. Um, and I do very, very much enjoy this when I do it, but this is, but I try, I try not to be too, uh, too much seduced by, by this, eh? because I try to be, uh, uh, you know, not, I, I don't want to choose wood again, just because I love it so much to, to work with. So, so I'm, I'm maybe not, um, not entitled so much because I, I try to stay out in a way to, to do that. And I, I, of course, as particularly the Australian series, that was an incredible experience for myself as well. Uh, of course, these woods are so wonderful and it's so, uh, you know, it's so special, all these timbers in Australia. And it's also, um, and when you look for these timbers, you, or these woods, um, you have, of course, uh, you come in contact with all these, they're called woodies. <laughs> they hear, they call themselves woodies. Yes. Um, we are familiar uh, yeah. with that term. Yeah, I, I don't know if that's an American term too, but um, and and uh, and and you come, you know, you 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 are in contact with all these people who are, um, which is it's their material they they have chosen. They they they, mm -hmm. you know, they can tell you all all about that, and they of course they have that. Um, you know, they they do it often also because they love that process so much, you know, and they love how, you know, the, the outcome of it. And I do too, but I try, I very much try not to, you know, that's because that's not the story I want to tell, um, therefore. But I can, of course, completely, um, uh, you know, I'm, 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 yeah, I, it's, 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 it's logical, it's so fantastic. And it's so, um, it's so precious and it's so unique and it's so, it does, you know, you have to really be in a conversation because it's, 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 it's a life and, and it, 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 it tells you where to go. You know, I shared the studio with two other uh, artists and, and, and one is Helen Britton uh, um, and the other one is Yuta Kaminegishi and he's, a, he's a, a working in, in a lot in wood, he carves rings and it's one of his materials, you know, the wood. And of course this is a, when he starts a piece, he never makes a drawing, he never makes a, it's just the process of, of being in the dialogue with that living creature and try to understand and try to follow what it can do and try to maybe provoke it a bit and try to and, and this dialogue is of course uh, I think that is probably not unique but it's very very specific to to the wood uh, to, to the woodwork not that I could make a, 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 a really a uh, 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 a very uh, intelligent comment on that. <laughs> <laughs> I think you have already. Um, we do have a couple of questions, and one you may I, you touched on some of these um, these concepts um, just in the last few comments, but I want to make sure that Christina um, has a chance to be heard, and her question. Um, starts at uh, the point about your abilities as a fine jeweler and how this um, way of working also adds to the quest or the discussions around preciousness of finished pieces. Um, and and but she's asking more from the point of view as someone who is involved in a process and shaping the materials and um, and your background as a fine jeweler and and the application of those skills into manipulating the materials. That is that is interesting because you know that's the reason I um, that's the reason I started with the small print machine because I was a you know I was a, a, a trained jeweler in Switzerland traditional. Uh, a, a traditional apprenticeship 
which is you know was four and a half years and it was uh, it's 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 and it was completely full of the dogmas of the goldsmithing guild and and the crafts uh, the, the craftsmen in that uh, uh, and and this made it paralyzed me completely and I, I was working for a jeweler I was making jewelry for for a uh, for a company um, and uh, after my apprenticeship, but I was not capable of making my own work at all because it was so, I, I, it, I was, it was so, it was so much affection in it. It was so much, um, you know, it was always this how to show how virtuous uh, with what virtuosity uh, I can uh, shape metal or uh, deal with the fire and uh, whatever, <laughs> and uh, and this um, so so that made it impossible for me actually to make jewelry. And um, after about ten years, you know, I I was making the smoking machine as the first jewelry work because I could I could not. Um, fall in the trap with this work. And this, the other one was the rubber lip. Um, you know, this rubber lip, um, that was um, the start was that I started to do these transformation works, that I take an object and trans translate it into something else. And, and the reason to do that was in a way just for me a help that I couldn't apply these skills. You know these goldsmithing um, guild dogmas, uh, and and I needed to look for different solutions, and uh, and 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 the playground of a rubber jar seal, <laughs> you know, to try to make it into a mouse uh, is very defined, and uh, and I just have to react on that, and I cannot uh, shape metal or so on and they uh, and so it took me uh, until until i made the first work i made in silver then was the, the the slugs you know i made slugs which were kind of a brooch um and that was the first work i could freely i thought now i'm freed of this dogma and of course i can embrace the skills i can embrace the skills and i'm very happy that I can solve my problems. You know, I'm very happy that I can make a cardboard out of silver, um, which is a very traditional goldsmithing process in a way. But um, uh, of course, I'm, I'm, I'm thankful that I've learned it. But, so it, but, but it, knew, it needed that gap. And it was very hard for me not to, not to go, you know, not to be cap caught there in this cage. Sure, sure. Um, the discussion of the studio as a playground um, and the confluence between play and work is a conversation that we should have in the future. I very much like to do that. Um, but in the meantime, we have one more question. I know we're at time, but uh, if David, David, if you are, if you have the energy, I have one more question from our sure. audience. And, um, and the question is, what technique is used to make fine metals look like cardboard? Um, uh, as a, it's, it's a very classic, as a, the, 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 it's a, I, I look at cardboard. So my interest always in these, with these translations is that I, I'm rather interested in how the original material behaves rather than how it looks like. So if I make a cardboard, I try to, I try to mimicry the process of cardboard making rather than the outer look of cardboard. That doesn't interest me so much. So I'm not, I'm not look, trying to make the mimicry in terms of it, its appearance, but in terms of its its behavior. So it's it's basically three layers of silver in this case, as in the cases of the silver ones, or, or three layers of gold, thin sheets rolled. Uh, of course, they're textured, uh, that they have a kind of a grainy uh, cardboarding, and it's soldered together. And then it's been, it, as soon as I've done that, 
it behaves like cardboard, I can bend it, it makes that, that what cardboard does. And the last one, which actually makes the trompe l'oeil in the end is that, 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 that impact of the staple, um, which of course I have to kind of create because you can't staple the white gold staple staple into the, the silver, but I can just um, pretend to do that by quite with a force and that distortion which happens on the surface uh, that tricks the eye then in the end and that's how it's made. I mean it's a it's a it's a it's a, in a way it's a very traditional it's one of the most traditional goldsmithing works I've made so far. <laughs> Well, yeah, thank you. If, so if that's if that uh, answers the question, I mean, yeah. Well, thank you for revealing a little bit of your studio secrets with us, and um, and thank you for sharing this hour with us and discussing your um, your conceptual and um, material choices in terms of the use of wood in your work. Oh, it's great pleasure. And it's wonderful to finally meet you, particularly you, Nava, where we had uh, you know, a, a little bit of contact and to see a little bit also where, where you come from. It's wonderful. Yeah, it's, oh, thank you it's so beautiful. Much. And now I can go back to make music and this is fantastic. <laughs> Well, this will not be the last time, I'm sure. Um, I, I, I'm happy to, if, if you have anything which, uh, where you think it's a, you know, I can make a contribution, I'm, I'm happy to, to be uh, in conversation, of course, if, oh, you know. Brilliant. We have all these witnesses here who have observed you saying that. Um, so <laughs> we, will, we will certainly take advantage. This has been such a wonderfully nutritious and enjoyable hour. Um, thank you for spending time with us. And I want to also thank um, Stefan Friedman of Ornamentum, who is here with us today for um, generously loaning the work, um, Pinocchio, to the exhibition. The exhibition hey, Stefan. <laughs> there he is. Um, I want to also thank the, the other loners who have um, generously parted with their works of adornment for the purposes of this exhibition, which runs until through November 7th. So you have a few more weeks to see it. You can also see it online, I believe. Oh, hi, Stefan, there he is. Um, you can also visit online. Um, so you don't have to be physically in Philadelphia to see the show. And um, Stay tuned with the Center for Art and Wood for more discussions in jewelry and the material of wood because there is so much possibility that this material offers. Join us on Wednesday. Join us on Wednesday, yes. We have a performance by um, uh, another artist in the exhibition named Deara Jones. And so this is going to be a very unique experience, um, bringing another dimension into works of adornment. So uh, thank you to everyone who has joined us today. We can't wait to see you again. Be safe. <laughs> Ciao, Philadelphia. Thank you, <laughs> Ciao, Nava. Bye, Ciao, bye. Katie. Thank you. <laughs>